Before the chanting, uh, we'll let um, Imogen, whatever you need to speak. Did you say, Imogen? Thank you very much. Well, it was just to say good evening to everyone and welcome. And thank you, Ajahn Sundara, for joining us. And just to tell everyone a little bit about Ajahn Sundara, who is originally from France, um, who was one of the first four women to join the monastic community of Chithurst Monastery in 1979 as an eight precept novice. She became a Siladara, a 10 precept arms mendicant nun in 1983, which, uh, with Ajahn Samedo as preceptor. And from its inception, she helped to establish the nuns community at Amaravati. From 1995 to 1998, she continued her practice mostly in Thailand in forest monasteries and has been teaching and leading meditation retreats worldwide for 30 years. And she currently resides at Amaravati. Thank you. <clears throat> so it's lovely to see you all. Can you all hear me? Good. It's a pleasure to see you all and to spend this time with you, focusing on Buddha Dhamma. So what we do usually, the first thing we do, well, we change sometimes. It's not always the same beginning. But we'll start. Wangu, where are you? Oh, here. Yeah. I'm here, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember. Did we say the chant with the... Uh, do you remember the, the, the precept of the chanting, the first chant? <clears throat> Dedication offering in English. First, yeah. Okay. So on page... Uh, let me see. One group will put the chants on your Zoom. So you'll know how to follow us. That's right, yeah. So the first thing we do when we do the chanting is that we bow to a shrine, to our shrine. You may not have a shrine in your room or where you are, but it doesn't matter. You can just pay respect in whichever way you can. We do the bowing forward. You can do it from your chair and just bow forward. It's a way of expressing our respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Okay, so we bow one time. We bow second time. And we bow a third time. <clears throat> so those who can follow the chanting, please enjoy doing the chanting. Those who find it difficult, or perhaps some of you just joined it for the first time, and it's all very strange and foreign, in that case, you can just do whatever you can. Just do, You can just listen quietly and get a sense of the chanting and how it affects you, you know. And, um, and we'll do it in English. It can be done in English, it can be done in Pali, it can be done Pali English together. But tonight we'll do it in English only. <clears throat> to the Blessed One, the Lord, who fully attend perfect enlightenment. To the teaching which he expanded so well. And to the Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, to these the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, we render with offerings our rightful homage. It is well for us that the Blessed One, having attained liberation, still had compassion for later generations. May these simple offerings be accepted for our long-lasting benefit and for the happiness it gives us. The Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one, I render homage to the Buddha, the blessed one. <clears throat> the teaching so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma.
the blessed ones disciples who have practiced well i vow to the sangha <clears throat> a bit further down <clears throat> now let's appear preliminary homage to the buddha that's on page 21 one go sorry we didn't do this is not quite the end um yeah 21 that's right now let us pay preliminary homage to the Buddha, homage to the blessed, noble and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble and perfectly enlightened one. We bow. Three times. Okay, and now we flow on page 120 something. Mayam Ritisarane Nasaha Pancha Silani Yachama. Dutiam pi maya maya tisarane na saha, pancha silani yachama. Tatiam pi maya maya tisarane na saha, pancha silani yachama. Namu tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambu tasa. <clears throat> Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambu tassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambu tassa uh, Up to you to do the same thing, okay? Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddham Saranam Gachami Buddham Saranam Gachami Namang Saranam Gachami Namang Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami Dutti Ampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Dutti Ampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Duti ampi dhammang saranam gachami. Duti ampi dhammang saranam gachami. Duti ampi sangham saranam gachami. Duti ampi sangham saranam gachami. <coughs> Tati ampi buddham saranam gachami. Tati ampi buddham saranam gachami. Tati ampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tati ampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tati ampi sangham saranam gachami. Tati ampi sangham saranam gachami. Tati saranagamana nitwitang. Ama ai. So I will say, okay, I will say, Imani pancha sikapada ni silena sugatinyanti silena boga sampada silena ni botinyanti tasama silan wiso taye. And these few lines means these are the five precepts. Virtue is a source of happiness. Virtue is a source of true wealth. Virtue is a source of peacefulness. 
Therefore, let virtue be purified. And at the end, you all say sadhu, 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 sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. This is just a way acknowledging, it's kind of well said, well said, sometimes it's translated, you know, but it's acknowledging what you've done in a positive way. So, all right. It ten to seven now, so we'll do um, a meditation for about half an hour, which I will guide you. For which I will guide you. Mm-hmm. So. The first thing you need to do, or not do, (laughs) depends how you see it. (laughs) First of all, just make sure you have a posture which is comfortable enough for you to stay in that posture for 30 minutes. Having said that, you can also, if necessary, if you're going to injure, Uh, uh, some part of your body, maybe the knees or the feet or the legs, you can, of course, move or change posture. You're on your own space, so there's no problem. Um, Sometimes it's good to wait to listen to the mind before you change the posture, because it's well known that it could be the mind complaining about something and giving you the idea that changing posture will help. So make sure that it's absolutely necessary for you to do so. So you close your eyes gently. And you spend the next few minutes just being aware of the experience of now. Don't try to have too many ideas. Don't try to have any idea at all, in fact. Just for now, you notice there is a quality of awareness. You're aware of it, aware of awareness. And this awareness enables you to have a mirror of what's going on within you, with the body, with the mind with the feeling, with the emotions. So first of all, before we embark on something more, um, you know, looking at different things, just stay with the body sitting, the feeling, maybe sensation you may experience right now, which help the mind from being involved with a lot of thinking The breathing, the natural breaths, in breaths, out breaths. So the first part of our meditation is to take a bit of time to let the mind calm down, slow down, and rest in the present moment with gentleness. Even though the spine is upright and is 
helping you to stay awake by having your back upright and uh, good posture. Shoulders are relaxed. The chin is slightly tucked in. As you sit quietly in silence, do not forget that meditation is here to help you to relax and to be kind to the moment you meet in each moment. I have a loving a sense of acceptance of each moment, how they are. whether you have tension, whether you have anger, whether you have body feelings, frustrating, or you receive all those experiences with a kind acceptance. And then you, you also at the same time begin to see the when the mind is still, then you can see more clearly the mind moving. The more mind is still, the more you can see the nature of your life activated in each moment. You can see things are arising and ceasing but you don't expect to arise or cease at any moment. You can't control that. So you learn to still the mind by just relaxing and receiving each moment with a feeling of benevolence, kindness. Once the mind has become more peaceful, more stable in the present moment, more established in the present moment, then you begin to see more clearly the movements of your thoughts, the movements of your emotions, the, the changing nature of everything we experience. It's a natural flow that's not always made very clear unless you look at it through the power of awareness, of mindfulness, of, of vigilance and focus. We're not focus, we're all over the place. So it's good just to see the moment, focus in the present moment. with a very open mind, not a, a tight, compressed mind an open mind, relaxed mind. And you remember those helpful sentences, going nowhere, being nobody. No, you can see the plans of your life coming and going, but you're not engaged, you're not trying to move with this these activities you let them you 
you focus on seeing the, the changes, the movement, the arising, the, the falling away. Notice when the mind is sinking into a kind of torporous mode. What helps, can, what can help sometimes is by stretching your back, stretching your spine, reestablishing a strong posture that gives you that enable the energy to flow through the body again. Your breath is natural, remember? If you feel that you're becoming restless inwardly or agitated, you can just go back to a simple object of meditation that some of you probably know very well already, such as the listen to the rhythm of your natural breathing or simply returning to the posture and being aware of sitting upright. Sometimes a mantra like Buddha, you do Bud when you inspire and Do when you expire. That can help just to simplify again the focus of your mind. You don't need to concentrate to implement. As soon as you're aware of something, you can see it. So instead of navigating to all, the, all kind of different parts of the world or things that you are going to do or you have done and so on, memories and then for a few minutes, maybe a, a few minutes, you just spend those few minutes just resting in the present with an object, a simple object of meditation, like the natural listening of the breath, the posture sitting upright, or just a repetitive little word like Bhutto, which means awake, by the way. Oh, or just resting in the present, aware of your posture, aware of the body sitting. These are all simple and skillful means to teach the mind to know the difference between being present and being lost into 
the past and the future. Or lost in reactivity to what you see, feel, hear each moment.
Just check <clears throat> what's happening now. Are you still, is your attention still focused in the here and now? Noticing change, noticing what is painful or whatever, happy or pleasant, unpleasant, you can begin to see more clearly the kind of how things manifest inside oneself, internally. And you can begin to open your eyes gently. Come to the end of our meditation. Now, go very gently, okay? Open your eyes gently and then <clears throat> stretch your limbs, your legs, your arms. And rotate your heads around a little bit. Everything has been kept immobile, still for half an hour. So so I'll give a, a reflection, right? And before I give a reflection, I think Imogen has to do a little invitation for me to allow me to say something. That's the way the Buddha established this tradition. You know, you have a, a chant inviting us to give some teachings. So please. Yeah. May I ask Ajahn, is that the same as before? Still in Pali or in French, in English? <laughs> <laughs> in French. <laughs> Maya, I tisara nena saha, pancha silani yachama, dutiam pi maya, I tisara nena saha, pancha silani yachama, tatiam pi maya, I tisara nena saha, pancha silani yachama. Uh, excuse me, Imogen. Oh, yes. For the teaching, so it's not here. It's a it's a page before. Ah, I'm afraid I didn't know that. Sorry, I will do that again. It's all right. We go to a page where the requesting for teachings. It's not the precepts, one go. It's the teaching. Yeah, further up, further up. It's just one person chanting it. There's no, it's a request for a desana. You can go further up. We're still on the, on the precept here, yeah? taking refuge. Okay. Come on, Piff. Yeah. We're still asking for the three refuges. There it goes. That's the Parita chanting further up. Shouldn't be. There you are. <laughs> so it's in Pali. I think Imogen, we don't need to do it in Pali or in English. Okay. You just uh, you just invite me to do, you know. <laughs> I just assume I'm invited. What do you? What have you done in the past? What have you recited in the past? Do you remember? We we haven't at this stage in the past, no. and I've not seen this before, so I would, I'm sure, not be able to do it justice. Um, but we would be very grateful for your Dharma talk. Okay. Yeah. The the chant is like that. Brahma chalo kadi pati saham pati kapanjali adi maya chatam. Santi da sata parajaka jatika de se tu dhamma manukam pimam pajam. <laughs> That's the invitation, requesting a dhamma talk. Sorry, Wangu, I don't think we planned this. 
So, okay. <clears throat> Namu tasa bhagavato arahato summa sambutasa. Namu tasa bhagavato arahato summa sambutasa. Namu tasa bhagavato arahato summa sambutasa. Buddham dhammam sangam namasami. So when we enter this journey on the Buddhist path, the most important thing of this path is that we're learning to be awake, conscious, aware. And we don't know we are awake and conscious until we really are, it's pointed out to us. We know how to concentrate and absorb into our work, our activities, in whatever activity we do, we can absorb ourselves into things, concentrate deeply. But just being awake is a new, for many of us, as was a new realiza realization to do something with full awareness of the present moment and really um, learn how to remain stable in that dimension of the here and now is a learning we do in our practice of Buddhism. It's a very different thing when you just uh, you know, you, for example, you're studying something or you're doing something particularly, go shopping or whatever. <clears throat> you may be, um, you know, you think you're present, but really when you double check, you'll recognize that your mind is busy with many other, other things, you know. You kind of may be very preoccupied about the past, preoccupied about the future memories you remember good bad pleasant peaceful loving caring miserable angry and so on so the whole path is about opening up the mind waking up the mind and uh, discovering this new dimension in our life this quality of presence of knowing here now. And it's a, it's a teaching that takes a, a, a certain amount of learning the context or its context because why, we, we, why would we want this knowledge of the here and now? What is it that brings us to this interest of knowing what it is to be mindful, to be present, to be clear-minded, etc., etc. I think being clear-minded is something that everybody loves to to have. Clear-mindedness is a it's a wish that's very uh, people like to have that kind of mind. What context is there for this desire to see things more clearly, to know things more clearly? What is it that uh, motivates us to want to be here every Monday? <laughs> to what on what? Have you ever questioned? What is it that brings you to generate enough energy to come I mean, we, you are in your room at the moment, so you're not coming to the Buddhist society, but you're in your library or you, 
bookshelves, near your bookshelves, or in your bedroom, in your dining room, sitting room, wherever, to spend this time just doing nothing, right? Very often in Buddhism, we um, we keep reminding people to be in the here and now, to establish themselves in the in the presence of a, awareness, focusing and at the same time with an open mind, not an absorbed mind, which is a the work of concentration. But of course. You need concentration. Remember, the meditation aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path is about effort, concentration, and mindfulness. Hmm? Three qualities we generate, we develop, to be able to develop our meditation practice uh, properly. So it bears some fruits, it bears some there's some good result to our meditation. And the good results sometimes can be confusing for people. They think they might get more happy, more, they might even kind of lose weight. They might be, you might lose weight because you don't focus so much on the cheese and on the chocolates and cakes <laughs> because you're more focused <laughs> on other things. Uh, or maybe, yes, your mind is dreaming of all kinds of possibility that's going to enhance your life through meditation. Now, this is not a wrong message, but what the mind doesn't know yet is what it takes to uh, experience these things, what it takes to actually see and know for oneself this, the result of one's meditation or one's practice. And <laughs> where that leads to. You know. So there's an aspect of the, uh, you know, of, of the teaching which have been came to my mind a number of times lately was uh, the talking a little bit about effort. It takes effort to come and sit, doesn't it? Not something that just, um, you know, it's like going on the armchair, you know, with the feet up in front of TV and just watching a program the news, a movie, or whatever. Watching the movie of my life is not as fun as having a somebody else movie. It can be quite boring. <laughs> we can get really disappointed with ourselves because our movie is rather kind of ordinary and not that interesting and repetitive. That's the worst part of it, the repetitive. It kind of goes again and again in the same old ruts. So when we talk about effort in meditation, uh, it, it, it's, it's not always easy to understand because the, our notion of effort is often um, comes out of what we know in our worldly uh, approach to effort. You know, if I want to put some effort into something, I have to, in a way, will myself maybe to do it. I know how to do it. And I'm going to do it, put lots of effort in do, doing something. So this is something we're familiar with that kind of effort, aren't we? It's not always successful, but we know what it is. <laughs> Someone, sometimes we put a lot of effort to, to eat and live healthily. Sometimes it works. Most of the time, fairly temporary. After a while, the mind and body are really fed up with it. And you might go back to your old habits. <laughs> this is a pattern I think we all know. The mind can sustain good intention only for a while, and then it might easily go back into the old habits. Why? Because it just doesn't have that energy to sustain itself, you know, the effort needed to sustain itself might not be present. Why? Because our, our understanding of effort is so much um, conjoined with 
me doing something. Do you understand? Me getting something. Me has to put a lot of effort to do it. And me is also an impermanent thought, an impermanent intention. So if after two weeks you finish, you've had enough to be on quinoa and you want to go back to your pasta, it's quite normal. <laughs> you've had enough to, be a, to have a healthy meal. You just want to have pizza and chocolate, you know, that's normal. So we're just navigating between the normal and our wish to improve ourselves. So this notion of effort is, is important because our effort sustains through the sense of I, I'm going to do something, is very much um, connected with thinking. And thinking is impermanent, remember that. So we do have to think though, to remind ourselves which direction we want to take. Sometimes, you know, if we just let ourselves, you know, down, our mind can go back into its natural furrow, just slide naturally into the, the same directions. And the mind, the, the body, mind, you know, they, they have that time of wanting to be lazy, wanting to be not bothered by things, not, you know, improve on anything, you get fed up. So the Buddha does encourage us, give us some guidance about what does it mean to develop right effort, you know. So I've got the text with me here just to give you the text of the Buddha because I think it's important. So this is what he says, what is right effort? So you have wrong effort and right effort. Okay. So here a monk awakens desire for the non arising of unreason, evil, unwholesome states. To me, the precept points to that. Do you understand? The precept, I refrain from harming any living beings. I refrain from stealing. I refrain from sexual misconduct. I refrain from lying. I refrain from taking drug and intoxicant that brings me into, you know, heedlessness and carelessness in my life. So the effort you're already doing when you take the precepts is what the Buddha talks about, you know, to actually, you are making effort and you are arising the energy to, um, you know, to, to not, you, you, it's like, you know, unskillful things arise anyway. They don't wait for you to be invited. But what you do when the Buddha talks about to um, desire for the non-arising of unreason, evil, unwholesome state, state. Okay, so when things are, for example, you may not be angry with somebody, but you know there's a potential to be angry. Yeah, so the anger hasn't a reason, and you're very mindful, you become very mindful, you put the effort to be really mindful, right, and observe what's going on in you, because it has not a reason. And maybe you have the choice of allowing your mind to not cling to a thought of anger that could be on the way. Do you understand? Yeah. So you may have, you have, we all have many mental states which are not skillful, which has not a reason yet. We don't know even we don't even know we have like jealousy, envy, arrogance, and so on. We might not know them in us, you know. And they are unwholesome state. But you know, in the in Buddhist teaching, when you read the suttas, sometimes it's um it's not always easy to understand because at some point 
things can arise and you begin to see from the transcendent transcendent the, the kind of transcendent uh, level when you begin to see them as anicca dukkha anatta when you see the three characteristic of existence you have already gone from the mundane level to the transcendent level of your life yeah but uh, you know this um you know you have to basically it's saying don't let you know don't let uh, unskillful activity mental states you know arise if you can actually be mindful of them see them and let them go right sometimes we're not so mindful they have a reason and we are lost we feel very confused by that So I just repeat it. What is right effort? Here, a bhikkhu awakens desire for the non-arising of non-arisen evil unwholesome states for which he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and endeavor and endeavors. Yeah? So that takes a kind, a, a certain kind of effort, because if we force ourselves too much, we might not be able to fully be aware of what's going on. We might just have an idea. We must put effort into something and repress and suppress things, which you know the result of suppression and repression is not always particularly healthy. It can stress, it can be very stressful. So I don't think the Buddha is asking us to repress and suppress, but to be skilled in not letting things that are unskillful arise. arise. It's a skill. It's not the skill of suppression and, uh, you know, and repression. It's a skill of knowledge, knowing how to do it, how to do this. Of course, the, the main aspect is knowledge, you know, when you know this can happen, then effort, energy to, uh, you know, face that situation with mindfulness and uh, care, and then to learn the skill of letting go. All this, it's a whole movement of the mind to come to that place of freeing the mind from those unskillful states. Then, <clears throat> yeah. And then when unskillful states have a reason, then you put effort to let them go. I repeat myself, but this is what it says here. So what the way the Buddha uh, presents it. He awakens desire for the abandoning of a reason, evil, unwholesome state for which he makes effort. He awakens desire for the arising of unreason, unwholesome state. Well, that's when you're going on the second part, bringing up good state of mind. So when unskillful states, for example, anger, jealousy, frustration, irritation with anything, any aspect of our life manifest in ourselves, then we have a skill, you know, of not lingering endlessly into proliferating about the wrong and the misery of our experiences. We know now we can be mindful as we are mindful, we have the power to see them clearly and allow them to go. Stop the mental proliferation. I should have done, I must have done, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, it's terrible, blah, blah, blah. We think, 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 think. Completely out of control. It only takes a few minutes to stop thinking, not repressing, just as a game. You stop thinking for a few minutes. <laughs> and funnily enough, Believe it or not, the mind forgets. <laughs> not because it's old and decrepit, 
But, you know, things pass away, they go. <laughs> you know, Anicca is our liberator. Do you understand? It's, uh, it's, it's uh, the one who takes it out of the prison of thinking you're stuck in one thing forever. To so trust it. Anicca, impermanence. Yeah? It's funny how we tend to, tr to trust more, ra you know, rapidly the things that are not correct and hurts us. So we all go through that. All human beings are prone to that kind of a approach. So something really makes you miserable. What do you do? You can really uh, let your mind think and think and think and think about it and make you feel bad and bad and bad and make other people bad, bad. And then you feel bad about making them bad and you, you have to make yourself bad again because you're, you have been saying terrible things about them, blah, 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 and then terrible things about you. Oh, my God. Endless. Doesn't stop. Now, a good Buddhist is somebody who is aware that he has a power to let things go. Even a cat. <laughs> you didn't think I saw it, did you? I wonder what you had in your hand, Judy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> so the second half of the of the uh, uh, of the um, effort aspect of the practice is he awakens desire for the arising of unarisen wholesome states for which he makes effort. He repeats again and again for which he makes effort. What else? How does he go? Effort arouses energy, exerts his mind, and endeavors. So that's pretty clear what he's asking, isn't it? Not again through suppression, through me having to do something, pressurize myself. I'm going to be the first. I'm going to be the best. You never want to be second, do you? So you'll do whatever you can, but then you exhaust yourself. So this effort is a, a subtle kind of effort because it's not the effort that's going to last just for a few hours or a few minutes, you know. It's that effort that comes from mindfulness, presence of mind, awareness. It goes together with these qualities. In fact, it's dependent on many other qualities that are all associated with the past. Peace of mind, for example can show you more clearly whether you have to put effort in something or not, whether something is unskillful or not skillful. But now the Buddha never, you know, doesn't ask us to feel guilty and horrible for, for, for years, decades afterwards for having done a mistake. We just remember this mistake and we treat it as a memory. This is a memory. This is not me who has done something 20 years ago. It's just a memory. Can you let them go? Can you learn to let go of a memory? Can you put effort, energy of let, letting go of somebody's hurt you have received from someone? The hurt, the misery, right? The things that are difficult to bear in life. Can we see clearly what they are? They might just be a, a repeat a kind of sentence that go roam, that roams around your mind again and again and again. And by doing that, of course, it influences all your mind and body. It has an effect on your energetic system. So that's why the Buddha asks us to put effort to bring about good things. Why? Because they do give you the energy you need to work with this path being generous, being kind, being loving, being caring, thinking of others rather than yourself all the time, being open to people, being open to your, you know, to the, 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 the thing that you find difficult, being open. So the Buddha says that again, I repeat, he awakens desire for the continuance so now the first one was he awakened desire for the arising of unreasoned wholesome states 
for which he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and endeavors. Then the last one, Ralph's aspect, he awakens desire for the continuance, yeah, non-corruption, strengthening, maintenance in being and perfecting of a reason wholesome states for which he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and endeavors. This is called right effort. Right? That's part of clear seeing, do you understand? It's difficult to think you have to make an effort if you don't see the need for it. <laughs> so we are constantly encouraged on the path of Buddhism, this path, path of the Buddha, to really uh, not torture yourself from having unskillful things coming up in your mind, in your thought, in your speech, you know, but to see them and to know that these things are actually unhealthy, painful, and not conducive to peace of mind, to good health, to happiness. Yeah. <clears throat> So he asks you to not allow unskillful things happening to you to kind of come up and cling to them. You're beginning to cling to them and then make stories and go on and on and on. Then you have bad dreams about it through the night <laughs> and you wake up in the morning feeling miserable. So it's good to not dwell on these things and to arouse the energy to really um, approach them and deal with them in a way that is, you know, described in a Buddhist teaching. Not, you know, feeling too confused about it, being quite clear what to do. Okay. And, you know, a good thing, one of the skillful things to do in our life is to learn how to let go. So we don't have to develop constantly being the good, 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 good. Letting go is actually one of the, the highest level of the practice. To see the ending and let things die, follow their natural course. Everything is dying all the time. Remember that. So whether you are being generous, whether you're being kind and helpful, whether you are letting things go and you abandon the unskillful, all these are right effort. Yeah. So I will leave you on these words. You can read stories about right effort, but right effort is always conjoined with mindfulness, awareness, an approach which is clear and not, uh, you know, use you know, that, that, that is rooted in the um, aspect of wisdom. Wisdom is a, a, a state of mind that is rooted in balance. In the middle way is a wisdom way. You understand? You can see the imbalance. You can see through awareness the, the, the imbalances of our chitta, of our mind, vision, view thoughts, feeling, and so on, what we think about them, what we feel about them, what we want to do about things, you know, because maybe our view is still not very balanced. So right effort is helping you to um, generate the, the your ability to um, come from a place of Steadiness, calm, understanding before you start reacting and blaming somebody else and blaming yourself and so on, you know. Just allow the mind to let things go and listen to the empty, silent mind if you want to solve problems. You might not have the answer straight away, of course, and we are often in a rush, aren't we? We want to sort out our problems really quick. But the most beautiful sorting out of problems in my life, I notice is patience, through patience, 
through ability to listen to what the mind is saying to you in your heart, right? And to let things go until at some point we have a solution. It becomes clear there's a solution in everything. Main solution is to let things go and return to the freshness of a new mind that's not <laughs> caught up, yeah, embedded in a lot of confusion. So I leave you on this. If there is any question, there's a bit of time. I can, um, you know, if I have any question on the sideline on chat, maybe I don't know if anybody. Right, well, there's nothing, so maybe we can stop. So, do not hesitate, huh? don't be too shy. Yes, you can unmute yourself if you wish, you're free. <laughs> to say what you want. Okay. Well, if you don't have any questions, then we can stop. We can do the closing homage. Yeah. And then say goodbye. I think I'm doing next week as well. So. <clears throat> the Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one. I render homage to the Buddha, the Blessed One, and we bow. The teaching so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma. The Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, I bow to the Sangha. So I wish you all a very um, good week. And I hope you can continue your interest in this practice through the week. And through the pandemic, and things are shifting and moving, constantly moving, isn't it? <laughs> the poor government is constantly you know, waiting for one thing, encouraging, and then, but we don't know another encouragement, but we don't know. <laughs> We're like, it's going to be okay. Well, yeah, but <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> it's good to do Buddhism, isn't it? You know, things are changing all the time. At least you're not surprised. <laughs> okay, take good care of yourself. Bye.